Hey everyone, in this video we'll be going through questions on circular motion calculations. It is recommended that you watch the videos on the basic theory of circular motion in different circumstances or scenarios before watching this video. A car of mass 1,200 kilograms is turning in a circle radius of 25 meters on a flat road. If the maximum static friction coefficient between the tires of the car and the road is 0.8, what is the maximum speed the car can take the turn without skidding? If we take a cross-sectional view of the scenario, we have the car here, and this is the front of the car, and let's say the car will be turning to the left here, there will be centripetal force directed towards the left, towards the center of the circular turn. In this scenario, the actual force that's providing the centripetal force is the static friction between the tires of the car as well as the road. And we know the static friction is related to the normal force that the road exerts on the car, and at the same time, the car will also have its own weight force. If the car was to remain on the flat surface of the road, then the magnitude of the normal force should be equal to the magnitude of its weight force. So from this theory, we can form two mathematical equations. In the vertical component of the force diagram, we can say the normal force is equal to the downward weight force of the car. And in the horizontal component, we can also say that the centripetal force, which is given by the equation of mv squared, over R is equal to the static friction between the tires of the car and the road. And in this case, the friction is also given by the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. And we can further modify this equation and say mv squared over R is equal to the coefficient multiplied by mg because the normal force is equal to the weight force. The mass of the car will cancel each other out and we'll have an equation of v squared over r is equal to the coefficient times by gravity. So the speed is given by r mu s times by g or square root. So let's substitute the values. Our radius is 25 meters. Our coefficient of friction is 0 0.8. And the acceleration of gravity is 9.8 on the surface of Earth. And we'll take a square root of all these values and we get a speed of 14 meters per second. If the car's speed was to exceed this value, then the magnitude of friction, that is the centripetal force, would not be adequate or sufficient enough to accommodate the greater speed. In that case, the car would no longer be in circular motion around the circular bend and therefore will start to skid off the road. A curve on the racetrack is banked at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal, and has a radius of 50 meters. What is the speed at which the car can safely take the turn without relying on friction? So this question examines circular motion on a frictionless bank surface. Let's draw a diagram. We have 30 degrees as a banked angle, and we can represent the car as a simple object, such as a box. As for the free body diagram, we have the weight force of the car going down, the normal force exerted by the bank surface on the car that will be perpendicular to the bank surface. Let's put that in. We can analyze this scenario in more detail by resolving the normal force into its vertical and horizontal components. If you've watched the original video on circular motion on bank surfaces, you should remember that this angle here by geometry is equal to the angle of the bank surface, so 30 degrees. The horizontal component would then be n sine 30 degrees, and the vertical component will be n cosine 30 degrees. Finding the vertical and horizontal component is crucial in this question because it allows you to form two separate equations in relation to the centripetal force and the weight force. First of all, if the car was to continue on its horizontal circular motion, its vertical height above the ground should remain unchanged, which means the force in that vertical plane should add up to a net force of zero. So my upward vertical component of net force, which is n cosine 30 degrees, should equal to the magnitude of the downward weight force. If the two forces are not equal, then the car will be going either up the slope or down the slope. In addition, as the car is going in the horizontal circular motion, we will expect the centripetal force to be directed towards the center of the circle in a horizontal manner. And the only horizontal force vector we have in our free body diagram is the horizontal component of the normal force. So in this case, 
and sine 30 degrees is equal to centripetal force which is given by the expression of m v squared over r. After we obtain these two equations, we can solve them simultaneously by dividing the second by the first equation. So n sine 30 degrees divided by n cosine 30 degrees is equal to mv squared over r divided by mg. The normal force cancels them out and sine 30 over cosine 30 degrees will be tangent 30 degrees is equal to the mass and mass will cancel out so we get v squared over rg. This allows us to obtain the expression for the speed which is equal to rg tangent 30 degrees square root. The radius of the bank surface is 50 meters and the gravitational acceleration value is 9.8 and will multiply by tangent of the bank surface angle, 30 degrees. And this gives me a speed of 16.8 meters per second. This is the speed at which the car can travel at in circular motion without relying on any upward or downward friction forces on the bank surface. A 2 kilogram mass is spun in a vertical circle with a radius of 1.5 meters. At the bottom of the circle, its speed is 6 meters per second. What is the tension in the string at this point? So we have a string and the mass is 2 kilograms. And let's say it's going in the vertical circular motion in an anti-clockwise direction. As for the free body diagram, we obviously have the weight force of the mass going down. We would expect the tension in the string going upwards to be greater than the weight force of the mass going down. This is so that when you combine the two vertical forces, your net force is positive going upwards. And this net force will be this centripetal force that will allow the mass to undergo circular motion. So the net force, which is also equal to the centripetal force, is equal to mv squared over r, and this is equal to the upward and greater tension force minus the smaller and downward weight force of the mass. To find the tension, we can make this a subject, which will be mv squared over r plus mg. The mass is 2 kilograms, the speed is 6 meters per second, we'll square that, divide by the radius of the vertical circular motion of 1.5 meters plus the weight force of the mass, which will be 2 kilograms, multiplied by the average gravity value on the surface of Earth. This gives me a magnitude of 67.6 newtons, and the direction of the tension force at the bottom of the vertical circle, like I described, will be upwards. A 60 kilogram person rides a roller coaster that goes over the circular hill of radius 20 meters. If the person's speed at the top of this roller coaster is 12 meters per second, what is the normal force acting on them at the top of the hill? So very similar to the previous example, this is also a scenario involving vertical circular motion. But in this case, it doesn't involve any tension. Instead, the additional force that acts on this in addition to weight force, which is going down, is a normal force of the circular hill acting on the roller coaster. Now at the top of this hill, the net force in the vertical direction will be going down. This will be the centripetal force because that we are at the top of the circular motion. This means the magnitude of weight force should exceed the magnitude of the upward normal force. So the net force in the vertical direction is again my centripetal force and this is mv squared over r and this is equal to the downward weight force subtract the smaller upward normal force. To find the normal force we can make this a subject which means we have the weight force minus mv squared over r. To find the normal force acting on the person, we have the mass of the person 60 kilograms multiplied by 9.8 minus 60 kilograms again multiplied by the speed of the roller coaster 12 meters per second squared divided by the radius of the circular hill which is 20 meters. This gives me a magnitude of 156 newtons for the normal force and the normal force in the free body diagram is again going upwards. A 0.5 kilogram ball is tied to a 1.2 meter long string and spun in a horizontal circle such that the string makes an angle of 30 degrees with a vertical axis. The radius of the circular path is 0.6 meters. Here we have to find two things. What is the tension in the string during the circular motion and what is the speed of the ball? Let's draw a diagram. So the vertical axis and we have the string making a constant angle of 30 degrees 
and the 0.5 kilogram ball is attached to the end of the string as it's going around in this circular motion that's horizontal. And we are also told this, the radius of the circular motion is 0.6 meters. The length of the string is 1.2 meters. Let's draw a free body diagram. We have the mass of the ball causing the weight force to act downwards. We have the tension in the string that's going towards the pivot point, that's called a T. We can resolve the tension into its vertical component, that's called a TY, and horizontal component, that's called a TX. To maintain the constant angle of 30 degrees and allow the ball to continue in its horizontal circular motion, the forces in the vertical plane, that is TY, and that the downward weight force should be equal in magnitude such that the net force in the vertical component is zero. So our first equation will be the upward vertical component of tension force is equal to the weight force going down. Now the angle of 30 degrees is the angle at which the string makes with the vertical axis. This means this angle here is also 30 degrees because we have two alternate angles on parallel lines. So Ty can also be written as T cosine 30 degrees is equal to mg. For my second equation, I will need to look at the forces in the horizontal plane. As the ball is undergoing this horizontal circular motion, the direction of the centripetal force is always horizontal and direct towards the center of the circle. And the only force vector that is in the horizontal plane and contributing to the centripetal force is the horizontal component of the tension force. So Tx is equal to the centripetal force. Now Tx can also be expressed as T sine 30 degrees because it is the opposite vector to the angle and the centripetal force can be written as mv squared over r as usual. Now we can find the tension in the string by simply using the first equation. The tension is equal to the weight force divided by cosine 30 degrees. The weight force is simply the mass 0.5 kilograms times 9.8 divided by cosine 30 degrees. This gives a magnitude of tension of 5.66 newtons, which is going up the string. Once we have the tension force, we can substitute this into the second equation in order to find the speed of this ball. The speed of the ball will be V is equal to RT sine 30 degrees divided by M or square root. So we can use this expression to find velocity or speed. So this is equal to the radius of 0.6 meters times by the tension we just found of 5.66 times by sine 30 degrees divided by the mass of the ball, 0.5 kilograms, and we'll square root our entire expression. This gives me a speed of 1.84 meters per second. The diagram shows a futuristic space station designed to simulate gravity in a weightless environment. If the space station has a diameter of 1500 meters, calculate the rotational speed needed to simulate 1g, that is 9.8 meters per second squared of gravitational acceleration. In this scenario, the rotation of the space station creates an apparent force away from the center of the space station that acts on an astronaut who will be standing on the periphery of the space station. This force is known as the centrifugal force. I should clarify, this is not the centripetal force, but the centrifugal force. It is the apparent force that's created by the rotational motion of a particular frame of reference. This apparent force that acts with the astronaut will then, by Newton's third law, that is every force has an equal and opposite reaction force, that acts on the astronaut in the opposite direction, this is the normal force. So as the centrifugal force acts on the astronaut, the feet of the astronaut will be acting against the ground, that is the outside of the space station, and the outside of the space station will then exert a normal force that is of the same magnitude are opposite in direction as the centrifugal force. As the astronaut and the space station continues in its rotational motion, the normal force will then be equal to the necessary centripetal force that keeps the astronaut in circular motion. So in this instance, the centrifugal force is equal to the centripetal force. The centrifugal force is the force that simulates gravity for the astronaut in this weightless environment. So we can say that the centrifugal force, this will equal to the mass of the astronaut, let's call that m, multiplied by g, which is a simulated gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared, 
and this is also equal to the centripetal force, which is mv squared over r. The m in this equation also refers to the mass of the astronauts. So we can cancel the mass on both sides to get g is equal to v squared divided by r. So the linear velocity of the space station is equal to the radius of the space station multiplied by g, or square root. The radius is half the diameter, so 750 meters, multiplied by 9.8, and we take the square root of this. And this gives a linear velocity of 85.7 meters per second. The question is asking for the rotational speed, so we can also present this answer as the angular speed, omega. So omega is equal to the linear velocity divided by the radius, so 85.7 divided by 750, and this gives 0 0.114 radians per second. Hey everyone, if you found this video helpful, smash that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Want even more? Become a Patreon member for early access to videos, exclusive Discord discussions about questions on chemistry and physics, and live preparation sessions for your exams. Don't forget to head over to our website for topic tests and practice exams to further improve your understanding and learning.